Um, so uh, I'm going to present an experiment support about Merlin, a language server for Camel. Uh, this is joint work with Thomas Refis and uh, Gabriel Scherer. Um, so Merlin started in 2013. Um, <clears throat> a language server is a tool that provides uh, information about the program that you are writing in the editor while you are writing it. So nowadays, uh, developers, like users of your experimental programming languages, will expect more uh, fine-grained uh, help from the editor. And by that, we mean uh, things like instant uh, feedback on error and warnings, uh, asking for information about the type under the cursor, jumping to the place where something is bound, uh, or completing based on uh, the current scope, like having understanding of the, the types in scope, the names in scope, um, and many more features that we can build once we have this information. Uh, it's not necessarily the language server protocol, but the language server protocol is something that appeared recently and which helps achieving this goal. And I will try to show what it looks like in practice. Um, so, this video has been contributed by one user of Merlin. It's uh, running uh, Visual Studio Code. And here you can see that by putting the cursor over some uh, module definition, you get the signature of this module. Uh, inside the code, you get type information about the uh, expressions. You can uh, ask for more information, jump to the definition where this uh, uh, identifier is bound. And here uh, we will get uh, completion and uh, information about error, uh, error, type errors. So that's just the kind of feature we would like to get. And we'd like to get this in a not expensive way because there are many editors and we have other stuff to do. So how did we implement that? The basic implementation is just a background job that listens to what happens in your editor. It looks a lot like a compiler front end. It will process the source code, do some analysis, and show back the result to the editor. But there are two main differences that we identified with respect to a normal compiler front end. Uh, we call them incrementality and partiality. Incrementality is the idea that between two invocations of this tool, uh, some work should be shared. The, it shouldn't change the behavior, it's only for performance purpose, but for the experience to be nice for the uh, user of the editor, uh, answers should come in less than 100 milliseconds. So incrementality is about uh, sharing some work to uh, improve the performance of the system. And partiality, um, because you are in the process of writing a piece of code, uh, hopefully it will be correct at the end, but while you are writing it, it is not. Uh, in particular, it is syntactically incorrect, and just giving up with a syntax error message would defeat the purpose of um, a language server. So we will work around that. In, in this experience report, we explain how we did that, the lessons we learned, and what you could uh, reuse to uh, implement similar service for uh, a programming language or a proof assistant. We focused on OCaml, so what we did is adapt the OCaml compiler front-end, uh, because OCaml is a large language, it's moving fast, and uh, we don't have the resources to maintain a fork. Uh, we choose to not change the OCaml, uh, <clears throat> not fork the OCaml compiler front-end, but adapt the tools that are used by the OCaml compiler front-end to make it possible to provide uh, the kind of experiences we are looking for. At a very high level, the idea is to make things pure, uh, and by that, I mean to manage the state and the effect of pieces of code. Um, the OCaml compiler front-end is mostly generated by tools. I mean, the lexer and parser are produced by OCaml Yax and uh, OCaml Yak, or more recently, Menhir. And um, <clears throat> so we will look at each, each piece of the compiler front-end uh, with the idea of what could we make incremental and how can we overcome this partiality problem. And the type checker already has backtracking, so it's able to uh, roll back some changes to reuse them in, uh, to reuse some work, and we will uh, use this feature in a way it was not intended at the origin. Um, so first, let's take a look at the system level. What does uh, the work of a language server looks like? 
So generally, you start from a build system. You, the user of a programming language will invoke a build system. The build system finds some works to do, then invokes the compiler for each of uh, these tasks. And uh, each invocation of the compiler will produce some uh, artifacts on the disk and consume other artifacts that had been produced later. In parallel, in our setting, the user is uh, working in uh, its editor. Uh, they, are, they have one file open that they are changing, and we would like to get information specific ab about this file. So the editor, rather than uh, invoking the build system, will send the text buffer to the language server together with some requests. The request is something like, uh, are there any errors in this buffer? What's, what is the type at this position? And so on. The language server will do some work which is very similar to what the compiler front end would have done. But rather than committing the changes to the, to the disk, it will uh, send a reply to the editor. So um, one thing to observe is that with this setting, uh, the communication of the work of the language server is stateless. Uh, the fact that it is persistent is only there for performance, but uh, it could be made a short-lived process, like uh, launching a compiler. <clears throat> so we reuse most of the work done by the compiler. We don't try to reproduce the work of build system and compiler. And uh, rather than committing something to disk, we uh, bring back the results to the editor. It's simpler to implement and to debug this way. Uh, but in practice, things get a bit messier. So uh, right now, this is the current state of the implementation. You should not look too much at this slide. It's just to show that it is convoluted. Uh, because you are targeting many editors, they all have their specificities. Um, you will need to write a plugin for each of the editor, and then you will have to work around some limitations of each editor. So this is what it looks like today, and hopefully we should be able to move to this uh, situation in a few years. So this is the LSP things I have been talking about earlier. Uh, the language server protocol is uh, an experiment, well, uh, a tool that is started uh, by uh, Microsoft. Uh, the idea is to provide a uniform API for all that kind of features, such that editors, uh, Visual Studio Code, Emacs, VI, implement the specification once, and you can connect many different language servers to this uh, interface. So in the future, we would like Merlin to work that way. Unfortunately, LSP was not ready when we started Merlin, so we had to, to do our own work. And I mentioned that for some EDT, uh, some uh, advanced features might need a custom work, but it's, once again, it's a trade-off. Like with LSP, you get basic features out of the box. And if you want to customize the interaction, say for a proof assistant or for some uh, advanced feature, you are still able to build on top of the existing uh, LSP work. Uh, <clears throat> now let's take a look at the changes we did to the front end to enable this. So here is a NoCamel YAC or Menir uh, specification. Uh, at the top of the, the, <clears throat> the slide, you can see the definition of the syntax tree we are trying to produce. So in this small language, we are interested in uh, expressions made of integers and addition. The two tokens we are looking for are integers and plus. There is some uh, ambiguities with plus, so we say it's right associative. And at the end of the slide, you see the grammatical rules. So an expression is either just an integer, which will produce a leaf of our tree, or it's plus in the middle of two other expressions, which will produce uh, the plus node. And when we compile that through Yak or Menir, we obtain this interface. Uh, so the X definition is turned into a function that we can invoke. And to this function, we pass a lexer. It's a function that takes a stream of characters and will return a token. This function will be invoked many times to extract all tokens from the input. And hopefully, if the analysis succeeds, we get a syntax tree. But if the input is wrong, we instead get a failure exception. So what we observe is that if something goes wrong, we lost all the work we did. We have no control about uh, what is done to the lexing function, and we lose some work. After our first change, 
uh, you get this interface. So we call this uh, incremental parsing loop. Um, the main change is that we now have a type parser, which is an explicit snapshot of the, of the state of a parser during the analysis. So the alpha on the left is the, the type of AST that you would like to produce if the parse succeeds. The step function takes a snapshot of a parser, a token, and tries to advance the analysis. Three outcomes are possible. Either the parse succeeds, then you get a result with the expected type. The parse failed, like this token was not expected in this context, so you get an error. Or more work is needed, so you advance the parse, but you cannot give any result yet, and you get an intermediate parser. And now, what was in the previous slide a, a loop you had no control over, is now something that you will uh, repeatedly invoke. You, you step through all the tokens of your input, and at each step, you still have the snapshot uh, that you can do more stuff with. So this analysis begins with the, uh, a, an entry point, which is this uh, extra value. It's the initial parser that has no token, but if succeed, produce a syntax tree of expression. So what we did, uh, we inverted the control. Um, with this, we get a cheap way to do incrementality because parsers are pure. We can reuse the shared prefix that didn't change uh, between two analyses. But more importantly, we now have uh, reified the state of the parser. And there are probably many more things that we would like to achieve with this uh, parser. So because LR grammars, uh, uh, <clears throat> this is an LR grammar. This is a formalism used by Yak and Menier. So because LR grammars are static, we can do a lot of analysis before uh, the execution, and that unlocks some, some cool applications. So in our case, we were interested in error recovery, which means being <coughs> robust during the addition of the buffer. But uh, we can also use this to produce error messages, uh, changing the grammar depending on some local information, or even emulating GLR. So LR is limited in its expressivity. This uh, static properties doesn't come for free. But um, GLR is a generalization, and with the kind of information we have when the parser state is reified, we can emulate GLR locally just for the interesting cases. So these changes have been upstreamed in uh, main here, and other people already started uh, using our change. And <clears throat> now let's take a look at what uh, recovery looks like when you're working on the uh, front end of the compiler. Um, so this is uh, <coughs> what a text buffer looks like during the edition. So some writer, uh, uh, some, edi <coughs> some user started uh, writing a F function, and you see that in the third line, the nothing yet uh, comment highlights that something is missing here. The user should write something there. Uh, when run with a normal compiler, this would fail. Um, but here, we still want to provide information to the user. So when the parser uh, fails, we'll invent some input uh, so that you still get an AST at the end. It's just that the values that will be put in the nodes that uh, could not parse successfully uh, will have to be determined by another way. So this is what we call recovery. We complete all parses. The parser always succeeds. And to achieve that, uh, we take a look at the LR grammar. Uh, at each state of uh, the parse, the LR grammar knows uh, what kind of some symbol are expected. So are we looking for an integer, an expression, or, or so on? And our goal will be to make up uh, one of these when the input file does not contain uh, correct information. To do so, we annotate the grammar with uh, recovery information. These do not affect normal parsing, but will be used when there is an error to uh, resume the analysis. For instance, uh, when trying to parse uh, a match case, uh, it's possible that just after entering the match case, the input is wrong and the parser do not, does not do what to do. Uh, with this annotation, we just say that whenever we, ne we need to produce a match case uh, value, but we cannot parse it, uh, just consider the empty list as a valid uh, match case. Um, <clears throat> of course, there are many ways to complete an invalid file, so we would like some control over the way uh, recoveries are selected. 
For instance, imagine that you're in a grammar, grammar rule where the only way to uh, finish this rule is to have a string, but the user didn't type a string in the input file. In this case, we are okay to introduce a fake empty string, but because it does not appear in the source file, it's not very nice from an experience point of view. So we, we introduce a notion of cost. Uh, because this recovery is more expensive, our uh, recovery tool will likely not use this one unless uh, there is no alternative. And finally, there is no need to annotate everything. Uh, we have a tool to do this development uh, interactively. So you write a, a normal grammar, and it will tell you in which state it's not possible to complete the analysis. And then for selected syntactic categories, you will introduce a recovery annotation to in explain how you want to treat uh, that class of uh, syntax problems. And for some uh, contrived uh, grammatical rule, it will ask you for uh, annotation just to finish uh, some local context. And uh, on the type checking side, we do something similar. So in a batch compiler, usually you get a parse tree. You give a parse tree to the type checker, and hopefully uh, you get a type tree, uh, an AC that has been <coughs> analyzed, or you get an error. But this is very inflexible. You already done a lot of work to produce the uh, analysis, the <coughs> types of the program, but because there is an error at some point, you give up all this work. Uh, what we do instead is add a wrong uh, derivation rule. We just say that there is an error. It's coercing arbitrary types, but it allows us to, to produce uh, a, a typing derivation that contains all the relevant information to help the user uh, fix this problem. <clears throat> and in practice, how, how do we implement the features I talked about with this design? So. First, when trying to complete uh, based on some local context, we have to select a namespace. There are many ones in Camel and even more ones in OCaml. So we do this by inserting a fake identifier where the cursor is in the editor. Because the user is uh, completing, they, will introduce, they want to introduce a new identifier. So we start by introducing a fake one. We send this to uh, our changed front end because of incrementality and partiality, we know it will always answer uh, with an AST. Once we get the AST, we look up the syntactic, or, uh, syntactic category of things under the cursor, we look up in the type environment, and we are able to uh, produce um, meaningful scope and around this uh, cursor. Um, that's the core of it. The conclusion is that with a few changes to uh, Normal, or compile, compile, normal compiler front end, you can get ID features for chip. Uh, you can get support for many editors with uh, upcoming LSP work. The core idea is to get, regain control about, of, over uh, what the, the front end is doing. And while not finished, our work is uh, being upstream right now, and <clears throat> we would like to release more of the tools we developed to, the, uh, to achieve a complete um, language server. And that's it. So thanks for your attention, and do you have any questions? All right, thank you. So Boy Stephen Smith Jr. wonders, how do you deal with mass refactoring? You know, when you have multiple files open, multiple files, and you know, you're working, you have a type error in one side, mm -hmm. syntax error in the oh, other one. So. so it's easy, we don't deal with uh, multiple file refactorings. We only work really on a single buffer. Right, right. Okay, so um, it seems like uh, to implement what Merlin does for what you presented, you seems to kind of need to hard code um, incremental uh, implementation of the compiler stack, right? And if we want to do this for Haskell, Right, so should we do all these changes in the compiler stack, or we can spare the effort somehow? Um, <clears throat> That's a question by me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I mentioned incrementality, but it doesn't have to be fine-grained. Uh, all we want is to be able to produce an answer within a reasonable amount of time. What might be possible to do is to retype check the current buffer entirely. I don't know what is your time budget. 
but keep in cash all the dependencies. And this already provides a much smaller uh, cost than launching a complete compiler many times. So I every feature I presented is really just a trade-off between how much time you can tweak things and uh, what kind of experience you would like to provide. All right, yeah. One, thanks. One last question. Joey Eremondi and Matthias Gisurason, they wonder about LSP, this protocol. How is that protocol suitable for functional languages or is designed for imperative languages? What was your, your take on that? Oh, so uh, I am not that knowledgeable about all details of this protocol, but um, yeah, there are two aspects. First is the synchronization of states, and this is transparent to all language. Uh, so LSP will solve this problem in any case. Then it's true that LSP focuses a bit more on uh, class-based, class uh, statement-based, like mainstream programming languages. But uh, if you reinterpret a bit the terms, uh, a lot of the features apply to functional programming languages. In particular, in the specification of LSP, they don't give a, a strong semantic meaning of, say, jumping to definition. So with a bit of loose interpretation, it's possible to reuse most of the features, and it's possible to implement your own on top of the existing ones. It's a All bit right. more work, but possible. All right. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you.